It's good to see everyone out tonight. If you want to open up your Bible to Romans, the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10, that's where we're going to start in just a few moments. Last year, one of my kids was doing a project for school where they got to pick a country from somewhere in the world, and then they would do a bunch of research on it, and then they had to give a presentation about all that they learned. And they came up with a a list of facts, and they had to talk about the types of festivities that they have in that country, and the foods that they eat, and the culture, and the music. And then they had a, a big celebration of all the countries, And the one that my daughter had selected that was uh, given to her was the country of Israel. And she was excited about that because coming to Bible class, she knows something and and is somewhat familiar with that, that part of the world. And so it was just an exciting thing to learn more about it. She even got to make some of the matzo unleavened bread and take that into school. And after it was all said and done, she said, Daddy, I really liked learning about Israel. And I said, well, that's, that's great, honey. And she said, well, do you think that you could take us there one day? And I kind of paused and I thought, well, that's a little tricky. Some of you in the audience have been to that part of the world. And we've seen pictures and heard stories about that. And it, it's an amazing an amazing once in a lifetime type of experience if you're able to travel to see the Holy Land and and all the places that we read about in the scriptures. But that is a difficult part of the world. And if you have been following the, the recent events, since early October, Israel has been involved in a an active conflict with the, the groups that are around them, Hamas, that controls the Gaza Strip, and then Hezbollah in the territory of Lebanon. And the situation has gotten very serious. And so that has been on the minds of a lot of people, and has been in the news a lot. You can't hardly turn on the, the, your phone or the TV or whatnot and not hear about it. And so what I'd like to do tonight is a little bit different than what, what we generally do, but I'd like to think about this question of God's desire for Israel. And we're going to kind of look at the history of Israel and, uh, and then make some applications from that. But I want to start in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Romans 10 and verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Now, Paul is writing this, and we know that Paul was a Jew. He says that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He grew up in the strictest sect of his people. He was a Pharisee, and he lived a life as a, as a follower of the Mosaic law. He was a Jew in every sense. To the point that when this new sect arose that that was teaching something that he believed was contrary to God's will, he was willing to lay his faith on the line and to try and persecute Christians, throwing them in prison, casting his vote against them. But that all changed on the road to Damascus. When he saw the light, he encountered the Lord And he was converted. He became a disciple, a follower of Christ. And from that point on, he made it his life's purpose and goal to try to tell others about Jesus, about Jesus Christ. So much so that Paul was receiving a lot of persecution from the Jewish people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says that On at least five occasions, he was beaten with up to 40 stripes. So he was facing tremendous amount of persecution 
and resistance from his own people. And yet here in Romans 10, he says that his desire, his prayer for his people was for them to be saved. What is God's desire for Israel? What does God want for Israel? I believe what God wants for Israel today is the same as what Paul wanted for Israel back in his time. But before we get too far into that, I want to take a step back and look at some of the history of the people of Israel. And so we're going to start at the time of the kings in 1000 BC, when David comes and captures the city of Jerusalem. And this is just to help give us some context about how has Israel, as we know it today, gotten to where it is. So we're going to start all the way back 1000 BC during the time of David. So David comes and captures the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites. They were an Ammonite tribe that was living in the land of Canaan. And probably the most well-known Ammonite in the Bible is a man by the name of Aruna. And it was Aruna who was there in the field with his sons when a plague started to come upon the land because of something that David had done. And it was at Aruna's threshing floor where David was instructed to build an altar. And it was that place that Solomon would ultimately place the temple on Mount Moriah. The temple was built on the property of this Jebusite. Well, for the next 400 years, there are kings that rule over the nation of Israel and Judah until 586 when the Babylonians come into the land and they conquer Jerusalem. They carry the people off into captivity and they destroy the temple that Solomon had built. And the people are are carried away from The land. It's a relatively short period of time, only 400 years from when David conquers Jerusalem to when the Babylonians come and take the people into captivity. It was prophesied in the Bible that for 70 years the people would be in captivity. And sure enough, uh, after 70 years, Cyrus gives a decree that people can now start returning to the land, to, uh, to Jerusalem. And under the direction of Ezra, the people begin to rebuild. And the second temple is constructed and finished in 516 B.C. In 332 B.C., so... Um, about 180 years after the second temple is built, we have our next major world event. There's a a young, uh, precocious leader who is able to, um, he uh, joins the Greek states together and he goes on a, a rampage throughout the known world. Alexander the Great begins to conquer all of the known world, including the land of Judea. And this places this part of the world under Greek control. The Greek language and influence begins to spread throughout the Mediterranean. But after Alexander's death, the territory is then divided up. And so the, this area would then be controlled by the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And there was a lot of back and forth between who was ultimately in control. And that would go on for the next 270 years until the time uh, 63 BC when the Roman general Pompey would come in and conquer Jerusalem and take control of the land. So who who's in charge? You got the Jebusites before David, but then David conquers Jerusalem. So then it's Israel, Judah, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece, 
the Ptolemaics, uh, the Seleucids, the Romans, and that doesn't include the Philistines and the Syrians and some of the others that are mentioned in the book of Judges. And so the point is that this is a very contested piece of land. It is constantly under turmoil. And part of the reason for that is where it's situated. It sits between the continents. Africa is in the south, and it's a crossroads as you head up into Asia and Europe. And so there is a lot of uh, armies that pass through that region, uh, even into the, the modern times and has resulted in a lot of, of turmoil for the people who are living there. Well, we come to the, uh, the modern era, and in 33 AD, Jesus dies on the cross. He's crucified by the Romans who were in control at, at this time. And this, of course, would set in motion the establishment of the church and the Christian faith, and that would ultimately forever change the course of human history. But not long after Jesus is put to death on the cross, uh, about 40 years later, in AD 70, the temple and Jerusalem are destroyed by the Roman general Titus. He comes and overtakes the city. This was something that had been prophesied about in the scriptures in Matthew 24 and Luke 19. Jesus had told his disciples that this was going to happen. And ultimately this is fulfilled in the lifetime of the apostles. Many of them were still living when this, when this event takes place. But the Jews continue to live in Jerusalem. The, they, they are expelled for a time, but then they were able to come back and live in the city after AD 70. But it's not until 136 AD during the Bar Kokhba revolt that the Jews are finally dispersed from <clears throat> Judea. Bar Kokhba was a military leader and many thought that he was the Messiah. And he had several victories over some of the Roman legions and the reaction from Rome was very severe. They came in and wiped out all of his forces, killed nearly 600,000 Jews. And from that point on, the Jews never really lived in Jerusalem again, as in a large part, until the modern era, until the 1900s. So this was a, a crucial thing, uh, that, that they are pushed out of the city. Well, for the next 480 years or so until 614, the territory is controlled by the Romans. And during this time, some of the Romans become believers, some of the Roman leaders become Christians. Most notable among them was Constantine, who in the 300s became a believer and professed faith in Christ. And he sends his mother, Helena, down into the Holy Land to try and go and find some of the sites that were significant to the Christian faith. And while his mother is there, she uh, commissions some churches to be built. So it's during this period that you have some of the first Christian churches that are established and built in, um, in, in the, the city of Jerusalem. But in 614... The, that was all about to change as the Persians come and they capture Jerusalem. They take control over from the Romans. And then about 25 years after that, after the Persians had come in, the first Muslim leaders would take control of the city in, six, uh, in 639. In 691, a... Uh, a significant event that we can still see uh, see today was the Dome on the Rock is built in Jerusalem. This is a one of the holiest sites in Islam. It's a Muslim shrine that is built on top of the Temple Mount, and it's been there since uh, around the 700s. And you can see there today, it's a very old structure, although it's gone through renovations. The, the gold on the dome there was added in 1994. 
Um, but this is considered one of the, the most sacred places in, in the faith of Islam. In, um, in 1099 through 1244, you have another period of, of history for this area. It's about 250 years when the Crusaders come. These are Europeans. They, they live in what is now Europe. And they are compelled to go down and to take possession of this, this territory. And they are successful in that. And so what you have is a, a conversion from Islam to Christianity in this part of the world. So much so that the Dome of the Rock becomes a church. They actually take the, the uh, crescent that is symbolic for Islam. They remove that from inside and they replace it with a cross. And so as there, there is this transformation that goes on, a period of 250 years where it's being controlled by, by the Crusaders. During this time, Jews and Muslims are expelled from the city. So they were prohibited from, from living inside of Jerusalem. 1250 through 1516, this is referred to as the Mamluk period. And uh, this is the Muslim caliphate is now over Jerusalem. And this was really a period of decline for the city. They tore down the walls. The population starts to decrease. And there was not a lot of emphasis being placed on this area until 1516 when the Ottoman Empire is established and comes into control um, the the leader Solomon the Magnificent that's how he's referred to he expands his empire to the east and the west you can see the territories all throughout the Mediterranean and he controls the land of, of Judah as well he would control that uh, the Ottoman Empire would be in control for about 400 years until the early 1900s when World War II or World War I would start. In 1917, the British during World War I would gain control of this territory. And then in 1948, we have the establishment of the modern state of Israel. So that's a lot of uh, information and dates and references, but what, what I hope you'll see is that it's, when we think about Israel today, sometimes we read in the Bible about the children of Israel, the land of Israel, and then we turn on the television and we see the state of Israel, and we can kind of get lost in what all has happened between what we read about in the scripture and what's going on today. There's been a lot of turnover and turmoil in this in this part of the world so the state of israel let's uh let's talk a little bit about how this came into formation so in 1896 there was a man by the name of theodore herzl he was a austro-hungarian political activist he was a journalist and he wrote a a, a pamphlet that he started to disseminate and, uh, and share with people. And he is considered the founder of the modern Zionist movement. Zionist is just a, a term for people who are trying to relocate Jews back to the Holy Land. So wherever they might be dispersed, they want them to go and live in Jerusalem and the surrounding, surrounding areas. And so uh, Herzl was a, a proponent of this. He was advocating it for it. Um, he was spelling out his vision for the future. He said that he wants there to be this, um, this future state where Jews will have a physical presence, a place for them to settle in, uh, in the Holy Land, that there will be an independent Jewish state. And so because of his influence and the influence of others in this movement, people start to immigrate back to the, the area of Palestine. They raise money, they purchase land, they open farms, and they start to settle communities down in this, in this part of the world. Well, in 1917, there was another big development, the Balfour Declaration. Balfour was a... 
um, a British foreign secretary, and he wrote a statement that basically supported the movement that Herzl had started. Up to this point, it had kind of been a grassroots thing. People trying to convince friends and neighbors and others to move down to the, the Holy Land, but this now put the movement on the map. One of the most powerful nations in the world, the, the British are now in support of this idea. And the Balfour Declaration essentially said, the, there should be an establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. So that was an official statement from the British government. Well, in 1939, you had the start of World War II. And when not, the Nazis started to take over, they were uh, interning Jewish people throughout all of Europe. And with the Holocaust, you had nearly 6 million Jews that were put to death by the Nazis. And so this really accelerated what, uh, what the Zionists had already been trying to do. You had a lot of Jewish people that were displaced. There was a lot of sympathy for the persecution that they had gone through. And so now people are immigrating down into the land of Judah the, or the, the territory um, in the Holy Land. They're starting to head down there and, and resettle after being displaced from the war. And finally, in May of 1948, the state of Israel becomes a nation. This was supported by the United States. President Truman voiced his support and the nation, uh, the, the country was formed. So from, that, from 136 AD, when they were pushed out during the Bar Kokhba revolt, until 1948, you have a long period of time where Jewish people are not living in this part of the world. But what does all this mean? Why is it relevant or, or significant? Well, you have a lot of people that, uh, that see these events as fulfillment of biblical prophecy. That uh, even though it had been 1,800 years since Israel had lived in this part of the, the world and that now they're, they're being declared a nation that this is somehow signifying events that had been prophesied about in the scriptures. And so there are many evangelical Christians that see the establishment of the nation or the state of Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. They they see this as um, this is part of God's plan for the world. And so the, the, the result of that is you have a lot of evangelicals that are praying for Israel. They are advocating for Israel. They are raising money for Israel. You may have seen some uh, drives where they're trying to get people to make donations for the cause of Israel. And there's a lot of uh, political activity that goes on with this. People who are uh, pressing politicians and leaders to implement uh, laws and rules and policies that will be beneficial to Israel. It goes beyond just a love for the Holy Land or the Bible Land and, and the nation. It's, they see it as in order for Christ to return, Jews need to be in control of this territory. And so in a way, this is people today helping the process along. They're getting everything in place for the Lord to return. And I'm not going to go into these terms, but you can, there's lots of reading out there on what is Christian Zionism and premillennialism. But the idea is that with Israel in control of the Holy Land, it sets the stage for the return of of Christ, And according to these doctrines, he's going to return to the earth and set up a physical kingdom in Jerusalem where he will reign for a thousand years. So that's why there's a lot of support in our country for Israel. Uh, it goes deeper than just this is a good nation. They have a good cause. There is a, a, a spiritual or a a um, theological basis for why a lot of people are supporting 
their, their cause. So let's close tonight with just a few observations, applications uh, on this topic. The first is, in regards to God's desire for Israel, we see from the scripture that the promises and the blessings that were made to Abraham, that were made to Israel, they ultimately will find fulfillment in Christ. And a, a good book to see the, the transformation of physical Israel to spiritual Israel, the book of Hebrews, we were looking at that this morning in our Bible class. But another reference to these promises is in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 16, it says, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Paul makes a point based upon the singular noun that's used in the Genesis text. He says that he's not referring to many people when the promise is made, but rather to one, that is, to Christ. And the point is that what was promised to Abraham ultimately uh, finds its fulfillment, its ultimate purpose in Jesus Christ. And you can make that statement for all that is said in the Mosaic Law, the sacrifices, the temple, the the giving of the law that ultimately finds its true meaning and significance in the coming of Christ. It was leading up to God's son. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, Paul says, So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Christ Jesus. There's no distinctions now. There's no Jew or Gentile. There's no Arab or Palestinian. There's no slave or free. They are all to be all one in Christ. That was God's desire that the the walls of separation would be broken down and in Christ they would be united. So these promises find their fulfillment in Christ. We also see that God's kingdom is not physical. It's not an earthly institution, but rather it's spiritual in nature. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And I, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. When God brought the people out of Egypt, it was very physical. The signs that they saw, the parting of the Red Sea, there was visible fire that was leading them by night. There was this cloud that they could see during the day. They had their physical needs provided for, the manna that came down. But in the New Covenant, he says that it's going to be different. They're not going to have the law written on these stone tablets that they put in a special box that stays in this sanctuary that they carry around with them. But the laws are going to be written on their hearts. It's going to be in their, in their minds. And he says in verse 11 that they're all going to know me. Throughout the, t- the nation of Israel, there was always people who were disobedient. that didn't follow what God had told them to do. But in the new covenant, all of them will be believers. They'll be followers. And they will be his servants. And that speaks to the spiritual nature of God's kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. It's why that Jesus, when he was talking to the woman at the well, he said that in, in my kingdom, it's not in this place, on this mountain or another mountain. The true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. 
And finally, the Lord's desire is for all people to come to know Christ and be saved. What is it that God ultimately wants for our world? What does he want for people who are living in other places? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 1, Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What does God want for people? Does he want them to acquire territory, to live in a certain area, to have a a certain amount of land or control of, of land? I believe that God is active in the affairs of the world today. But Paul says that what we should be praying for, what we should be focused on is peace and quiet that not the peace and quiet, that things are calm outside and you can get some rest and it's not noisy, but peace that would allow God's word to continue to go throughout the whole world. And he says this, all people, he mentions that uh, multiple times, that all people would have the opportunity to be saved. Ultimately, God is concerned with all people. And that means that he loves Palestinians and Jews, people living in Gaza or or Lebanon, and every part of the world. God is concerned about all people. And so we need to pray for peace, but ultimately our prayer should be for peace between God and man that people can be reunited and joined to the one who created them. That there would be an opportunity to come to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to close tonight with an invitation. And if you're not a child of God, we want to give this opportunity to invite you to commit your life to Christ to become one of his children and to enter into that family of, of God's people. If there's something that we can do to help you with that tonight, please come down to the front as we stand and sing. Science